You know, bartering's been around for how long? Since the beginning of time. Since the beginning of time. And, but there's a lot of people that still don't understand the concept of bartering because they've never, never experienced, never it. experienced it. So, I've had people ask me if, if I could talk about bartering. Um, I know, as a young girl, I seen my grandpa do it. Oh yeah, I've done it, but not necessarily in the same way that it has been done. Well, but <clears throat> let's read what it says here. I've got notes here that way. I don't say nothing wrong. <laughs> I don't really think there's anything wrong. You can say it. It's, it's, it's just whatever people are. Well, it, uh, bartering is the exchange of goods and services between two or more parties without the use of money. Yes. It is the oldest form of commerce. Individuals and companies barter goods and services between each other based on equivalent estimates of prices and goods. Now, this is something I did not know. You didn't know? I did not know that the IRS considers bartering to be a form of income and incurs taxes. There's uh, a big write-up back here about it. <laughs> I'm not going to go into that, but I did not know that. Well, that's kind of interesting, mm -hmm. isn't it? It is. I don't know that anybody done that, do you? Uh, no, but that's what it says. Because really, when the, most of, the, of it went on in this country... A lot of it was during the Depression, and they didn't nobody have no money. No. Even and, to pay the IRS. Yeah, and I can remember the way my grandpa <laughs> done it is, you know, he had the big farm, and he had cattle, and he would, um, like his, his other farmer friend, he would say, if you help me, you know, come over here and help me cut fescue, and we'll use your, your combine, and... I'll give you fescue seed. Or? I mean, they just kind of bartered back and forth to help each other instead of the exchange of money. And at that time, they were, fescue was coming into the country. Uh, a lot of people were sowing fescue. So it was something that <clears throat> wasn't grown locally much and had come into the area. And seed might have been harder to get. That right, that and, and people couldn't afford it. I mean, you're just because a person had a big farm didn't mean they had lots of money. That's for sure. They had something to eat, but they didn't have no Right. Money. It says the benefits of barter. <laughs> Bartering allows individuals to trade items that they own but are not using for items that they need while keeping their cash on hand for expenses that cannot be paid through bartering, such as your mortgage, medical bills, and utilities. Bartering can have a psychological benefit because it can create a deeper personal relationship between trading partners than a typical monetized transaction. Bartering can also help people build professional networks and market their businesses. Because businesses barter too. They did. In an uh, economic crunch, bartering can be a great way to get the goods and services you need without having to pull money out of your pocket that you don't have. You know, at one time, <clears throat> and even in this country, I can remember my dad talking about, uh, he was born in 29, <clears throat> just before the Great Depression, but... His mom and dad now all lived through it, and the stories were told. And you could take items from, if you had something from the farm, you could go to a store in town and say you had a dozen eggs, and you could trade it for a pound of flour or whatever how it was, whatever they decided on. And then they would take them eggs and maybe sell them to somebody else or trade it to somebody else. Because during that time, especially by... 1933 there there wasn't no money i mean they just nobody had money at all even some of the you know some of the wealthiest people of course had money but there was businesses that got shut down completely and they had no money it's true so bartering like you said it's been here since the beginning of time and people have had to use this instead of money because there was no money <clears throat> Um, I think maybe some people, of course, you have to have a relationship with people, and even with your family. You can barter with your family. 
you may have somebody, like you said, that's got chickens and they've got eggs and they're raising chickens for meat, but you may have hogs or you may have corn that you put up and y'all just kind of trade back and forth. I need some eggs, so I can give you a little bit of pork and we trade off that way because you need some pork. Our neighbor up here, just for instance, Miss Peppers, she's an elderly woman. And, you know, I know she's fine, but if things got really bad, it would be a, it would be us as good neighbors, Christians, just to go to her and give her what she needed. So we have to consider that, too. You yeah, have to we help. have it. And, you know, it's, it's like during the Depression, they was, uh, and we're probably going to read a story about that, but a store owner that, Business was actually going under because people had no money, but he had shelves and shelves of goods, and he was feeding people and giving it to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, when it gets to that point, you know, <clears throat> you know, you just have to help your neighbor regardless. Yeah, you got to help each other out. Times get hard. You have to be willing to go the extra mile. But there's always that, that avenue of bartering with people that you know have the commodity or whatever you're needing and you have something that you can barter back that it does it works and it, it just helps each other but um right here is telling you how companies barter companies may want to barter their products for other products because they do not have the credit or cash to buy those goods it is an efficient way to trade because the risk of foreign exchange are eliminated. The most common contemporary example of business-to-business -business barter transaction is an exchange of advertising, time, or space. It is typical for smaller firms to trade the rights to advertise on each other's business spaces. Bartering also occurs among companies and individuals. For example, an accounting firm can provide an accounting report for an electrician in exchange for having its office rewired for, you know, from the electrician. Now it talks about how countries barter. Countries also engage in bartering when they are deeply in debt and are unable to obtain financing. Goods are exported in exchange for goods that the country needs. In this way, countries manage trade deficits and reduce the amount of debt they incur. Modern barter exchanges. While it's mostly associated with commerce during ancient times, bartering has been reinvented in this era through the Internet. Online barter exchanges became especially popular with small businesses after the 2008 financial crisis, which which uh, commuted in a great recession. I do not know what that means. But anyways, so at one point, people started going online and doing barter exchanges. So, I mean, <clears throat> you could go on and on and on. Recently, 2008. Yeah. There's a lot of people that got hurt. <clears throat> A lot of people got hurt. And one thing about bartering is people tend to think that it's face value, face value. It's apple for an apple and orange for an orange. But it's not necessarily that way. If you have something that I really need and I have something that you really need, it doesn't really matter if this product is worth a little more or a little less than the product I have or they have. If you agree upon that exchange, then that's between you and them. It doesn't have to be, you know, you get to thinking, people get kind of greedy and they get to thinking, well, you know, this pound of bacon is worth a lot more than a dozen eggs. And, and it is, but. But it's all in what you need. But if you need eggs. You can't get, have that greediness in you. And you do so much, eggs are in everything. So, I mean, no, you can't, you can't be greedy. No. You have to, I mean, that, you know, that's between you and that person. Whatever you decide on, and that's the way it is. It doesn't really matter. That's between you two. You're not 
it's not necessarily costing them anything. It's not necessarily costing you anything. You, you have that agreement. You know, back when a handshake meant, you know, like a contract written. Yeah. Up. Well, that's just the way it was, and it and should be. And you know, we live in a around a community of Mennonites, and not too far from Amish, and they barter a lot. They do a lot of bartering. They still practice that a lot. Yes. And that's what helps them get by. So I don't know if that answered any of their questions about bartering or, you know, it might help you just kind of realize what what it means and that it's been around forever and ever. I don't have any problems with bartering with others. Do you? No. I think some people might have a little issue with it. Uh, maybe, I don't know, but to me it's just... It's just as normal as night and day to me. I mean, it's just, and if you have lived through hard times, then you'd be glad to be able to barter. Oh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. You read so many stories of, uh, you know, children doing without, but as a parent, if you could barter to get your child some oatmeal, in exchange for going and, and cutting a tree down or something, surely you would do that. Yes. And that's a lot. A lot of that went on. And it may, you know, go on before we know it, you know. These things are going to have to, uh, we're going to have to work together. And we could do with a lot less, couldn't we? Yeah. If we had to. Oh, yeah. You but can, the Lord has always provided for us. That's right. But we could do with less. You can do with less, that's for sure. Oh. Uh, and I, uh, and we're going to read some stories about the Great Depression, and you will see what people do. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, which really, when you look back in history, you know, people have had hard times forever. Yes. Just trying to make ends and meet. people more than others. And trying to put food on the table. It's always, always been there. And I feel like we've become a country of very spoiled people. So when it comes to mm -hmm. hard times, we just, everybody just starts, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And they get so scared. And well, we have a, a, a people that haven't really got to experience. That. No, they, they don't know. That's what I'm saying. You know, it's when we not... first were married, we experienced hard times. And it wasn't like they could have been. They wasn't bad like that. But we had to watch every dollar. We, I had to work usually more than one job. And we were raising kids. And. Money wasn't plentiful. It wasn't plentiful in this area, this but we plentiful. made it. No, it wasn't because people didn't work. No. Like you said, you'd have two or three jobs. It was, it was just the, the money pay, just the pay wasn't. Rate, yeah. what you received. Uh, but it, and on the other hand, it was probably the, for the most part, all they could afford to pay mm -hmm. you. So. You know, it, it was what it was. And even, you know, talk about family members bartering. Uh, that can be done, too, because a lot of families grow these big gardens. And uh, I know I've told this story a hundred times, but, you know, us being on hard times and little kids and your grandma, you know, she'd call up and say, you come help me pick this garden. So I'd come go help her pick that garden, and she would give me stuff out of the garden because she knew that we could use it. So she got my help and the kids' help picking the garden, plus we got fresh vegetables and stuff out of that garden because we helped her. You know how many years I helped pick that garden? And <laughs> never, got, never got nothing out of it. Oh, I bet you got plenty I of got, meals out of it. <laughs> I, got, I got meals, but I, as um, far as uh, cash, no, but my grandma taught me a very good lesson about that. Uh huh. That's right. We didn't get cash for that. We got the food out of that garden that we picked. And the, I've, I've told this story, but of this same woman, my grandmother, my dad's mother, Gladys. Uh, I was mowing their yard. My I mowed their yard all the time, and 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 never got a dime for it. You know, and didn't expect it. You just that was just the way you just helped take care of your grandparents. But a lady had hit her up for me to come mow their yard and silly me i said well what does it pay 
That was a mistake. <laughs> because she said, how much money you got in your pocket now? And I said, I don't have any. She said, well, regardless of what it is, you'll have more money in your pocket. <laughs> don't you worry about what it pays. If you have none, you'll have some. You'll have some. You'll have more than what you had, Absolutely. regardless. Absolutely. And that, that stuck with me forever. Yeah, that's true. That's why I say we've become a country of, of spoiled people. So like you said, no matter what it paid, you had more than what you had because you had zero in your pocket. Yeah, I was young. <laughs> I was able to go mow 20 yards if I needed to, but it, it didn't matter, you know, just. And that was a, a lesson that I learned and understood well. I was, we were gifted this book by a very dear friend. Her name's Donna, and I hope she's watching. And um, we want to read y'all a few stories out of this book. It's very interesting. It's uh, Memories of the Great Depression, and it's got several different... Uh, it's people that lived through it. Yes, several different people that wrote stories in here, and we want to share the stories and the pictures with you. And the thing about it, it's all over the United States during the Depression. Mm -hmm. From the Dust Bowl country. From up to Vermont. From to Vermont to, you know, different parts of the country mm -hmm. of what went on. But, you know, they were in a great dust bowl west of us here in Kansas, Texas, and, and Oklahoma and all through there. But, you know, it was it was really bad. The book is called We Had Everything But Money. And if you get the chance, of course, we won't be able to read all of it to you today, but we'll we'll do it. We'll Tell go. Story. We might do it off and on. We'll do it off and like on until we get all the book read. Very interesting. I've done been reading, and so has Mr. Brown. So we want to read it to you, and we want to thank Donna for sending it to us because it's very interesting, and I think you're all going to find it interesting too. This book is dedicated to our parents and grandparents, the young adults who refused to be defeated by the Great Depression. We are their sons and daughters, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, much of who and what we are was shaped by them. It was their fate to be afflicted by the wars, plagues, famines, epidemics, droughts, and floods of near Old Testament proportions. Yet they did much more than survive. These ancestors of ours stubbornly and bravely endured, sustained by their Bibles, their patriotism, and their determination that things could be made better than they were. There was a generation that went from outhouses to outer space, from kerosene lamps to computers, from straw mattresses to supersonic jets. They made do during the bad times and adjusted to monumental changes in the world around them. They preserved, persevered through it all, ensuring their happiness and fulfillment on the belief that family was what mattered most. Stop for a moment and think about their lives these pioneers of the 20th century. As they reached their late teens, they marched away to fight the war, War I, the war to end all wars. What it really turned out to be was a barbaric battle of rat-filled trenches, poison gas, and mud that shattered minds as well as bodies. More than 116,000 Americans died, and another 204,000 were wounded, many to live out their main lives in veteran hospitals. Tough times at home. Meanwhile, back at the home front, 500,000 500, of their neighbors, parents, and children died from the worst influenza outbreak ever. So Johnny came marching home and married the girl he left behind and started a family and settled down to earn a living. And just about the time things seemed to be going pretty well, the Great Depression hit. Soon 35% of all Americans were out of work. Banks closed, insurance companies failed, 
businesses locked their doors. On top of that, the great droughts of 1934 and 1936 burned out the heartland and entire states were turned into the Dust Bowl. Those of us who were children in those years often say, we didn't know we were poor. True enough, but our parents knew. And the pain of broken dreams and raising their children in poverty never left their hearts, not, for a long, not as, for as long as they lived. Nevertheless, these were tough people, and somehow they made it through those bad years, made it through and then wept as their sons and daughters went off to yet another war. They endured the frightening weeks with no mail arrived. They watched their neighbors hang gold stars in their windows and prayed that Western Union wouldn't bring the dreaded telegram. Beginning, the War Department regrets to inform you to their own house that message was received by 405,000 parents and young wives. Eventually it ended, and these ancestors of ours watched their children start their own families. I cherish a photo of my own mom and dad sitting close together on the sofa, beaming upon their first grandchild, my firstborn. Like so many of their generation, they felt they had a second chance and could make up for those depression years when they wanted to do more for their own children but couldn't. But fate wasn't through with them yet. All too soon they sat numbly as three beloved grandchildren were sent off to another war in a place called Vietnam. Think of it. Look at life through my mother's eyes a husband-to-be, a son, and a grandson, all wrenched from her and sent to places she had to look up in the World Atlas. I have another snapshot. It's of me in the Army uniform facing Dad as I said goodbye before going overseas. It was the first time in my whole life I ever saw him cry. It wasn't until years later, when I had sons of my own, that I understood his tears. What a generation. They were tougher than Vermont granite. You have to wonder what depths of faith could possibly have kept them going. Theirs was a self-reliance and grim courage that sometimes bent but never broke. It wasn't till March, it wasn't until much later when they reached their 70s and 80s that you could read the stories of their lives in their faces. There was a permanent sadness around eyes that had shed too many tears and seen too much misery. There was a stern set of mouths that had sometimes gone years without a lot to smile about. Through it all, they were patriots. My dad asked to be buried with a flag over his casket. And I remember the day my mother visited me in Philadelphia, touched the Liberty Bell. She held her fingers on it for a full 10 seconds, as though two centuries of history were flowing through her like an electric current. She turned with tears in her eyes and said, this is the most wonderful experience of my life. Okay. Well, James S. McLellan, Greenville, Maine. Children's efforts made a difference. Memories of the Great Depression vary with each of us, depending on where and how we lived. I was living on a small farm near Clinton, Maine, where we had a few cows and a large woodlot. Unlike many families in the city, we never knew what it was to be hungry or cold. We had little or no money, but neither did any of our neighbors on the surrounding farms, so we never felt we were suffering. Like all farm children, my sister and I were expected to do whatever we could to help out around the farm. In the early years, we weeded the garden, helped keep the wood box filled up, washed dishes after all our meals, and did other small chores. There was never any thought of being paid for what we did, and there was no such thing as an allowance. 
we accepted that what we did was part of making a living. Children who had enough to eat and clothes to keep them warm felt lucky. Most of us knew families in towns and cities who had much less. At age eight, I started helping to milk the cows and was so proud when I was able to turn the separator to remove the cream. Mother made our own butter and I helped with that too. The butter was traded in town for staples like salt, flour, and sugar. Little money ever exchanged hands. I like to hunt and fish and after selling After selling a clovering salve to buy a 22 caliber rifle, at age 12, I helped fill that family larder with a variety of game, including grouse, snowshoe hares, and squirrels. We had a trout stream near our home, and I often brought home enough trout for dinner. That was on days when it was raining too hard to work outside. I didn't remember that it ever rained too hard to fish. About the same time, I began trapping for fur-bearing animals to raise a few extra dollars. During the great during Christmas vacation, when I was 13, I trapped ermine that sold for more than $60. What a windfall to give to you an ideal how much money that was for a kid to earn. My father had to earn hire men who were helping him cut pulpwood for paper. Those men were paid $20 a month plus board. By age 15, I was hunting for larger game like deer. The gun, steel trap, and fishing pole were not recreational tools. They were what helped us put food on the table. The depression was still with us when I got married. I don't know whether I was stupid or brave, back in those years, but after we paid the preacher, my young wife and I on, had only $5 to start our married life. But we also had a supreme faith in ourselves and the future. As we took look back now on those long ago years, we realized they weren't all that bad. We not only survived, but we were have become better and stronger people for the experience. Well, I hope that y'all enjoyed this video and learning what bartering means if you've never experienced it or if you have done it and you experienced in the past just uh, just thinking about going back to those days of bartering and the stories of the Great Depression. We just got started on this book and if y'all would like for us to continue to read the wonderful stories of the Great Depression and what so many families went through, just let us know in the comments. And every once in a while, we'll pick up this book and we'll finish some of the stories in here because there's quite a few really wonderful stories, sad stories, stories that you just don't know how they got through it, but they persevered through it. It's just... Um, it just gets in your heart, but uh, if y'all want us to continue, just let us know. This, the story I read was by Clancy Strock, a contributing editor for uh, Reminence magazine. Uh, I used to get that magazine. I don't get it anymore. But he done a wonderful job starting this, the book out. And then uh, Mr. Brown continuing his story and uh, there's just so many good stories in here so we want to read them all to y'all so off and on we'll pick the book up and we'll get on here and uh, we'll have story time of the great depression so i hope y'all liked it guys uh, we love y'all and we hope everybody's doing fine um we had some snow we're supposed to get more snow um but we'll be okay um there was some bad storms that went through Texas. In fact, it went through the part of Texas where I lived till I was 13 years old around Pasadena. And I pray for them families that were impacted by that. Um, 
just don't I don't think you you see uh, bad storms like that you know do so much damage in them areas like that very often I'm not sure but y'all can let me know um, but uh, I hope everybody was safe and nobody got um, you know I'm sure there was people hurt I don't know I haven't heard really much about it so if there was any fatalities or anybody hurt, please let us know because uh, it's always a sad situation when people are so uh, uprooted and, and damage done and, and even loss of life when it comes to storms. It's just so heartbreaking. So we're, our prayers are with y'all. Guys, if y'all like this video, please give us a thumbs up. Um, if y'all want to keep us around for a while, always give us a thumbs up because that's what's going to keep us around. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe um, because uh, that's what YouTube goes by and what they look at uh, to keep us going. So even though our, our thumbs up and thumbs down and all that stuff, it is private. We got it where it's private so public can't see it but we can see it and youtube can see it so please give us some thumbs up and uh we'll see y'all in a couple days uh we've got a lot going on but uh it's getting time getting time to think about the garden situation and all that um, so i got some things coming up about gardening and some different new things that i'm going to be doing this year and i want to share them with you so Guys, we'll see y'all in a couple of days. Y'all be safe, be well, and uh, stock them pantries up because you just never know. But you'll be okay. God loves you. We love you. See you in a couple of days.